Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. This will be the last video before I take a break for the summer. This has been a busy year for me, beginning with the Russian documentary and the podcast by Demystifying Science, which are once again linked below. Michael and Anastasia also did a video on the sun, which you might be interested in viewing. With the video today, I am concluding my planned analysis of water and the microwave background. This is the fourth video on water and if you have not watched the first three, take a look. In the first video, I demonstrated that water not only has the proper bond strength to emit in the microwave and infrared, but also that it appears to have the correct structure, namely hexagonal planar. In the third video, I also discussed the importance of electron delocalization and the presence of at least some pi orbital characteristics across the OO distance in water. The presence of pi orbital characteristics is vital to being able to produce a black body spectrum. If the bonds only had pure sigma character, then one would not expect a black body spectrum to be emitted by water. So the partial electron delocalization across the OO distance actually is very important. When it is combined with the known strength of the hydrogen bond, then water definitely possesses all it needs to emit a black body spectrum in the microwave and infrared. The fact that water can behave as a black body was proven in the optical range when water was shock compressed. That strongly suggests that it can do so in the microwave and infrared under normal conditions. Now some might try to dispute the fact that water has structure in the liquid state and they will point to experiments with neutron bombardment or x-ray diffraction in order to argue that water does not have an organized lattice. I disagree with the conclusion of those experiments precisely because the methods themselves are much too harsh to sample the presence of a fragile and fleeting lattice in water. Such methods reveal a great deal about solids, but their value is questionable in the liquid. When I doubt the value of x-ray diffraction and neutron bombardment, one might question my logic because I use nuclear explosions and shock compression in establishing that water does possess a proper structure to act as a black body. The difference is that shock compression or shock waves from nuclear explosions do not target a single region of the lattice. Rather, the wavefront moves across the boundaries containing billions and billions of atoms at once. So in a sense, although the methods appear violent to the observer, it can be argued that they are in fact much more gentle relative to what the lattice is experiencing. Remember also that we must think of water as composed of two separate bonding systems. In essence, it is as if we had two separate materials existing as one substance, but with two distinct emissive mechanisms. All of these considerations relative to water should be concerning for cosmology. Water will turn out to be the cause of the monopole signal we so impressively recorded with the COBE satellite. Cosmology was simply too eager to assign the monopole to the universe. Still, in cosmology's defense, we monitor the Earth all the time using satellites, as can be seen in this image displaying sea surface temperatures by the NOAA. We therefore believe that we have monitored everything water has to display, but unfortunately for cosmology, the situation was actually much more complex than anyone involved in the early years could have anticipated. The key point in discussing microwave images, of course, depends on how they were produced. Relative to sea surface temperatures, many factors enter into the final result. A map like this one can be composed of input from as many as 12 sources, including both ground and satellite data. For instance, for many years now, sea surface temperatures were monitored directly with either moored or drifting buoys, and such devices are still utilized. They provide an accurate sea surface temperature at the depth of operation. Here is an image from the NOAA displaying the location of drifting buoys around the world. Many countries also have moored buoys in their territorial waters. Here is such a map for the United States. Buoys sample sea surface temperatures at depth of 1.5 to 15 meters depending on the design of the buoy. 
and they are often used to calibrate satellite findings. Prior to buoys, sea surface temperatures were also sampled from ships, and that continues to be true, although the sampling in that case is limited to the principal shipping routes. You can learn more about data from ships in these two papers. In any event, one thing is certain. If remote sensing of the oceans could be executed without problems, one would have little use for measurements obtained by ships and buoys. But the reality remains that in preparing data for release, scientists do take advantage of buoy measurements in order to validate satellite measurements. If one is to measure the temperature of the Earth, one might begin in the infrared. Here is a map of the emissivity of the Earth in the infrared at 8.6 micrometers as described in this paper and found on the NASA website link below. The emissivity ranges from 0.6 to 1. Surprisingly, deserts and arid regions have the lowest emissivities. Examine the Sahara, for instance, the southwestern portion of the U.S. and Central Australia. At the same time, regions which are rich in moisture tend to have an emissivity near 1 at this wavelength. Of course, the microwave background lies in the far infrared and microwave region, with a much lower peak frequency of about 1.9 millimeters. So the IR emission of the Earth is not really of concern to us. It is important to simply highlight that the Earth's emissive behavior in the IR is strongly affected by the presence of water, as we see from viewing the deserts in the IR. That is something that raises a red flag. Relative to infrared measurements of the Earth, it is also important to note that IR sensing using satellites is blocked by cloud cover, which raises another red flag. Fortunately, however, this is not the case for microwaves. Remember that clouds are composed of tiny water droplets and ice crystals. These are likely to have very different effects on impinging electromagnetic radiation. Before we turn to microwaves in the sea, let us consider why the COBE satellite was launched and how the atmosphere absorbs in the microwave as seen in this figure. First, let's reflect on what is happening when one attempts to upload or download a signal between a satellite and a ground station on the Earth when the signal is characterized both in terms of phase and amplitude. Evidently, one would want to avoid frequencies where the atmosphere strongly absorbs. The transmitted signal in that case would be absorbed by a molecule. Then if local thermal equilibrium is to be preserved, it will be re-emitted in all directions and phases. As a result, one would observe a net decrease in signal intensity. However, relative to the microwave background, this complication does not occur precisely because the incoming signal is both phase incoherent and omnidirectional. As a result, the atmosphere is unable to distort the shape of the thermal spectrum. It is as if there was no atmospheric absorption of the microwave background at all. Still, if one attempts to measure the microwave background from the Earth, one has to subtract the emission from the atmosphere, as one can learn in the initial paper by Penzias and Wilson, and later in the work by George Smoot et al. In Smoot's paper, he describes measurements from the ground at an elevation of 3,800 meters, where the atmospheric contribution is reduced by a factor of three. This serves to emphasize why attempts were made to monitor the microwave background with balloons and rockets prior to the final launching of the COBE satellite to an elevation of 900 kilometers. At such elevations, the atmospheric contributions to the brightness temperature becomes essentially non-existent. Relative to COBE, it does have a thermal shield designed to protect its instruments from solar and earthly radiation. Surely the shield has some effectiveness in preventing signals arising directly beneath the satellite from entering the fierce horn. But what about signals originating from the limb of the Earth? Could such signals diffract over the shield? We have already noted in these videos that Professor Wilkinson was concerned that the COBE shield had not prevented diffracted earthly signals from entering the fierce horn. Furthermore, I noted in this video that although the initial COBE results were presented from 1 to 20 reciprocal centimeters, the COBE team soon dropped the lower frequency data below 2 reciprocal centimeters. That is highly concerning because diffraction is known to be significant at the lower frequencies. Given what we are about to learn about microwave emissions from the Earth when examining the limb of the Earth, the removal of this data must be questioned. Next, we turn to a few images of uncorrected brightness temperatures in the microwave. We begin with a global view of the Earth, showing only the continents as obtained by the NOAA-20 satellite using the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder Instrument, or ATMS. 
The satellite was launched on November 18, 2017, and is orbiting the Earth every 101 minutes at an altitude of about 870 kilometers while traveling from pole to pole. At first glance, this image appears okay. After all, most of the continents have a brightness temperature near 300 Kelvin. However, upon closer examination, we already notice that something strange is happening in the microwave. Clearly, the Sahara should not contain any yellow, even at this time of year. A yellow color would correspond to something near minus 30 Celsius. Similarly, Greenland should not be in such dark blue. That would imply temperatures on the order of minus 100 Celsius. On the date of this image, it was 22 Celsius in Nuck, Greenland, which is on the west coast of the country. That is a temperature which should be in red. Clearly, there are factors besides real surface temperatures which come into play when one examines microwave images. If you are interested in understanding microwave remote sensing using satellites, there are many great textbooks. Ulibe's texts are classics and we will refer to them soon. In addition, here is a freely accessible review paper on microwave remote sensing of the oceans, which contains a great deal of information. Now many things affect microwave remote sensing of the oceans. If one goes to the NOAA website linked below, one quickly discovers everything that can be measured, including vertical profiles of temperature and moisture in the atmosphere, rainfall rate, total precipitable water, cloud liquid water, snow covers, snow water equivalent, snowfall rate, sea ice concentration, ice water path, surface emissivity spectra, precipitation, sea surface salinity, sea surface wind speed, and land surface temperature. In order to extract such information, NOAA makes use of varying frequencies and data combinations. Those details are not central to our discussion. Nonetheless, Ulibe presents figures in his text which demonstrate that when sampling oceans at 19.34 gigahertz, the brightness temperature for the horizontal polarization component increases from about 82 Kelvin at wind speeds of 0 meters per second to about 98 Kelvin at 14 meters per second. This corresponds to 1.06 plus or minus 0.16 Kelvin per meter per second. But wait a minute, what are we talking about here? Surely the sea is not at 98 Kelvin. In fact, this highlights another warning for the cosmologist. The sea is not reporting a brightness temperature corresponding to the true temperature of the oceans. We can easily see this for ourselves by examining the microwave images provided to us by the NOAA-20 satellite. So let us have a look at these three global images obtained by the NOAA-20 satellite at 23, 31, and 50 gigahertz. The first two sample quasi-vertical polarization. The third samples quasi-horizontal polarization. However, that image does not differ much from this image obtained using the METOP-B satellite with quasi-vertical polarization at the same frequency. Let us expand the 23 gigahertz image and have a closer look. Over much of the oceans, the brightness temperature corresponds to about 160 Kelvin, that is more than 100 degrees Celsius below zero. In addition, there is a clear effect of sampling, as each orbit provides a yellowish-red region near the central section of the satellite path. Next, let's expand the 31 gigahertz image for viewing. It is very clear that the oceans are seen as emitting with a brightness temperature as low as 140 Kelvin, depending on the angle of observation relative to nadir. Finally, here is a 50 gigahertz quasi-vertical polarization image from the METOP B satellite. Once again, the oceans of the Earth are not acting as black bodies. So how are the oceans behaving? We can get an idea from this figure reproduced from Ulibe's classic text. In this figure, the computed brightness temperature of the oceans is depicted as a function of frequency. The plot assumes a salinity of 36% and presents both vertical and horizontal polarization. Note how the directional spectral emissivity of the oceans changes over these four frequencies. If one is looking directly down at the oceans or at the nadir angle, then the oceans appear to have a temperature of 80 to about 130 Kelvin. As one moves away from the nadir angle, the horizontally polarized brightness temperature slowly moves towards zero at 90 degrees, which corresponds to the horizon. Next, the vertical polarization moves to a maximum value near 280 Kelvin at about 75 degrees before dropping precipitously to zero at the horizon. Without exception, microwave sounders typically sample the Earth at an angle of less than 50 degrees from nadir. One can see that in this case, the vertically polarized brightness temperatures will be between 130 and 175 Kelvin. 
the horizontally polarized brightness temperature will be about 60 to 90 Kelvin. This is true if one neglects the curvature of the Earth, but in reality the curvature is present. So when one samples at an angle of 50 degrees from nadir, the vertical polarization brightness temperatures increase somewhat, while the horizontal polarization brightness temperatures decrease. But what we care most about is what happens at the horizon. There the calculated brightness temperatures at these frequencies is zero Kelvin. And that is the problem for the cosmologist because this computation takes no account of the effect of the hydrogen bond in water. So now that we have studied some of the results from microwave sounders, the next subject of interest is to review how these satellites are actually calibrated. Typically, several approaches are taken. The first is to provide an internal blackbody source to act as a calibrator at the ambient temperature of the satellite as we can see in this figure. The temperature of the calibrators are carefully monitored using electronic sensors. Calibration beacons can also be placed on Earth. Finally, satellites often utilize the 2.7 Kelvin monopole signal from the microwave background. Professor Ulibi states this in this manner. Satellite-borne radiometer systems use a third type of cold calibration source, namely outer space. When the antenna, or an auxiliary antenna, is pointed at cosmic space, it observes a brightness temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. The question is, where exactly does the satellite point in order to sample deep space? Shockingly, the antenna is pointed towards the limb of the Earth. It is not pointing to deep space at all. Here are pointing angles typically used in calibration, and here is another quote. It will also be possible to use external calibration sources to validate the calibration on orbit. These fall into four categories, ground beacon, the Earth's limb, radiometric references, the sun. The ground beacon is a noise source that periodically transmits a brief signal in an narrow beam. Since the location of the transmitter is known, this allows for absolute phase calibration. The Earth's limb also acts as an absolute reference, since the space background temperature of 2.7 Kelvin is known. So there you go, they are not pointing at deep space at all. They are pointing either at the limb of the Earth or very close to it. Here is another quote. For the other calibration data point, the cosmic background radiation is also sampled two or four times consecutively. Here, however, the radiative environment is much more complex than during the warm calibration target view. Although the cosmic radiative temperature is well known, 2.72 plus or minus 0 0.02 Kelvin, significant radiation from the Earth, as well as reflected Earth radiation and direct radiation from spacecraft structures enter antenna side lobes. There is therefore only a very limited unobstructed view of space between the Earth's limb and the spacecraft horizon. So obviously there are problems in trying to use the microwave background to calibrate satellites. Things are not as simple as they appear. In any case, watch out for the Earth. Here is another quote. As each field of view is scanned across the Earth's limb, a pronounced drop in the brightness temperature will occur as the cosmic background, about 2.7 Kelvin, enters the field of view at a viewing angle of about 62 degrees, assuming a satellite altitude of 830 kilometers. They go on. The angular distribution of brightness temperatures resulting from this simulation are shown in figure 9 and show the precipitous drop in brightness temperature at the Earth's limb. Now I have decided to reproduce the main features of their figure 9 such that we can all consider it. They assume an open ocean view for their simulation and do not consider any obstruction from land, which is fine for our purposes. I present only an average general feature for the plot. One can consult the paper for the exact figure as it is linked below. The central feature is that the plot is for frequencies near 50 GHz, which represent vertically polarized brightness temperatures that should be moving gradually towards zero at the horizon. The problem with the plot is that the oceans of the Earth could be acting as two separate sources. The first source is associated with the hydroxyl bond and produces the observed microwave emissions from the oceans in a manner which is not blackbody. However, we also have to worry about a second source, the hydrogen bond. It should have the ability to produce a blackbody spectrum at 2.7 Kelvin in all the oceans. In fact, given what we saw at the beginning of the video in the infrared, everywhere where water is present on Earth, that is essentially on the entire planet, except over surfaces of deserts. 
So now we have a problem because the hydrogen bond in water can act as a black body emitter and easily fill the detectors of the microwave sounders when they are pointing towards the limb of the earth. Remember, black body radiation is not directional, it is omnidirectional. Given this fact, it is clear that the microwave sounders never measured 2.7 Kelvin in deep space during calibration. They are measuring 2.7 Kelvin coming from the Earth itself. That was the same problem for the COBE satellite, with diffraction from the Earth's limb into the fierce horn, and the fact that the COBE team began omitting data from 1 to 2 reciprocal centimeters. Next, we return to the Planck satellite. In these videos, I had highlighted that the Planck satellite never measured the monopole of the microwave background. Failure to measure a monopole at L2 is absolutely unacceptable, given what we have now learned about microwave sounders which surround the Earth. We know now that these satellites use the microwave background for calibration. When they do so, they are actually pointing near the limb of the Earth while arguing that they are pointing at deep space. But yet, the Planck satellite located at L2 was simply unable to calibrate using the monopole. You recall that the Planck team used the dipole for that purpose, as we saw in this video. This highlights that the monopole is in fact not present at L2. It is a product of the oceans of the Earth, as I mentioned numerous times on this channel. It takes a vibrational lattice to produce a thermal spectrum, and none was ever present at the Big Bang. This is why water will carry the day relative to the monopole of the microwave background. That is also why astrophysics is about to accept the reality that the stars possess lattice structure. They are not gaseous plasmas. Penzias and Wilson measured the oceans, and then permitted the signal to be assigned to the universe. What a tragic mistake for astrophysics. That mistake is about to cause the collapse of the entire discipline. Well, that is all for now. With this video, our analysis of the microwave background now comes to a close. It took a total of 25 videos to complete the review of the microwave background. They are now listed in a playlist. I have also completed the analysis of Kirchhoff's law, and that playlist consists of 13 videos. The laws of thermodynamics are also found in the video playlist. Finally, I have treated much of the work on the Sun, both for the gaseous model and its problems, and for the liquid metallic hydrogen model. The major points in this regard have been made. Although I hope to expand the analysis next year to various star types. In any case, it is time for a summer break, and I will return in the autumn. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel. Mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club. Help spread the word by contacting faculty in academic departments, not only in physics and chemistry, but in the earth sciences as well. They have interest in the microwave background, and that interest is likely to grow. Tell them about Sky Scholar, and do your part in spreading the word. If you wish, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on the next video.